but a warm welcome to this, the first of the Bonavera discussion group series for the beginning of the Oxford Trinity term. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've for the first time ever taken our discussion group um, online and we are absolutely delighted to be joined by an eminent international lawyer who's here joining us from Canada, um, Professor Obiora Okafor, um, who's former chairperson of the UN Human Rights Council Advisory Committee um, and a UN independent expert on human rights and international solidarity, as well as being a tenured uh, a professor of international law at Osgood Hall Law School in Toronto. A very warm welcome, Professor Okafor. Before we turn to your presentation, I'm going to ask our member of our technical team, Sanya Santani, just to explain how we've set this up to try and make it um, a pleasant experience for everybody and um, just to give you some of the ground rules of how we're going to operate. Sanya, can I turn to you? Thank you, Kate. Uh, we're very glad to host Professor Okafor here today, um, despite the circumstances. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about how we're running today's meeting. Um, everyone's meant to be on mute and put their video off at all times. Uh, in the event that you want to ask a question from Professor Okafor, please type in the chat box at the bottom. Um, you will be able to type questions out to the hosts, that is, Bonavero Christos, as you will see on your screen, Gayatri, um, and me, Bonavero Events. Uh, you could send us your questions. Alternatively, if that's too complicated to figure out, just type out in the chat box, the question will be shown to everyone. And we will collect questions, and then we will put them to Professor Okafor. So towards the end of the presentation, he will then respond to those questions. Uh, if at any point in time you're having an unpleasant experience for whatever reason, please don't hesitate to contact Bonavero Christos, again, as I pointed out, Gayatri, Bonavero Events, that's me, or even Kate Reagan, who's also a host in the meeting, and you will be able to contact her. Um, those are the main ground rules uh, that we've got. Again, any feedback, any questions, we're here to have those conversations. Um, we're trying as much as we can to prevent any sort of security issues where Zoom bombing might take place. Um, so in the event, in the hopefully unlikely event that that happens, um, please stay calm. We will try to remove uh, the unpleasant elements as quickly as possible. Should that be impossible, we will end the meeting um, just so that we can further protect uh, the security and privacy of everyone in the meeting. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't happen. And uh, I now hand over to Professor Okafor to proceed with the conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, uh, to Professor Reagan, uh, and I must say, uh, uh, one of my favorite judges on the South African uh, Constitutional Court uh, from my judges. Uh, I'm sure she didn't know that. Perhaps I knew that and had read her decisions, but um, I'm sorry for saying it now in public for the first time. And also to the technical team and everyone over at the Oxford uh, Institute. Um, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to, to be able to, uh, I guess, join this conversation, uh, speak uh, on, this, on this topic, uh, which I think uh, uh, is a very important one, uh, particularly uh, at this time and even uh, for, for some time before. Um, so the, the topic uh, uh, that I'm going to speak on uh, is on the future of the UN Human Rights Council. Initially, I meant to speak on the system as a whole, which is, um, of course, broader than the council and its subsidiary bodies. Uh, in other words, includes uh, the treaty uh, bodies as well. But I, I found that uh, one couldn't do justice to that in the time uh, that I have. I'm happy to take any questions on the treaty bodies as well. Uh, it's a huge uh, number of uh, treaty bodies and issues with that. So I decided to focus uh, on the on the council and and its uh, and its bodies, uh, its subsidiary bodies uh, for today's uh, uh, talk. Um, all right. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm, I'm just trying to move along my PowerPoint. Um, not uh, the most technically savvy 
doesn't seem to, oh, wonderful, it's working. Um, so there's the outline uh, of how my uh, presentation will proceed. I'll make a brief introduction. Uh, I'll speak hopefully briefly about the attainments of the council as I see them, uh, the pros uh, problems uh, uh, of the council, um, and then I'll uh, make some uh, modest uh, proposals. Hopefully, I'll have some time to flesh them out. Uh, I'll see what I can do uh, in the 45 minutes uh, or so that I'm told that I have. Um, now, in terms of the goal of the talk, uh, is to, is to basically, uh, my end goal is to articulate some ideas uh, on the means of preparing and positioning the council to better achieve its stated goals, right? So in the near to medium term, um, uh, the, the, the talk is sort of on a somewhat methodological point uh, is based not just on my knowledge and study, but also on my experience, uh, having participated in the work of the council and some of its subsidiary bodies uh, for some time now. Um, uh, and I'm going to focus on the council, uh, the special so-called special procedures, uh, which uh, I will explain at some point, uh, the complaints mechanism of the council itself, as opposed to uh, the UN treaty bodies that you can petition, and uh, the universal uh, periodic review, uh, so-called UPR mechanism. Now, I would not focus in depth on UPR. That itself could be the topic of a full day conversation. It's a massive topic, uh, but I would say, yeah, a few things about about most of these uh, 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 bodies. Um, all right. Um, uh, just to, to to reinforce again that that uh, what I've found is that both my study and experience have um, illuminated each other, right? In a sense, so the experience has driven study, and the study has helped uh, uh, in the actual work and the experience. And it's at somewhere at that juncture uh, that I position the ideas that I, I'm, I'm going to develop uh, in this uh, talk. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, just to briefly on the overall, uh, if you like, broad mandates of the council, uh, you can see the, if you like, the constitutive instrument or document that's set up the council transformed it from the uh, Human Rights Commission, the UN uh, Commission on Human Rights, uh, now defunct into uh, what we now know as the Human Rights Council. That's Resolution 6251 of 2005. And you can see uh, there uh, promotion of universal respect for human rights, a forum uh, for human rights dialogue. And this is extremely important and often missed, uh, where various perspectives and points of view come together uh, to be debated and accommodated. Um, um, it also meant to address in various ways uh, through making uh, passing resolutions, preparing treaties, and so on, um, condemning uh, violators, uh, so, to, to address uh, situations of violations of human rights, uh, coordinate a mainstream human rights within the UN system itself. And uh, of course, the UPR, Universal Periodic Review uh, of Compliance with the National Human Rights Law of States. All states, it's universal, it's periodic, and it's, uh, it's uh, a fairly rigorous review. Uh, and also then to make recommendations on how to promote and protect human rights. So we need to keep these goals in mind if we are to assess the council and to uh, offer any ideas um, as to how to make it fitter uh, for the future. Um, let me begin uh, quickly with uh, uh, some of the attainments uh, of the council, some of its achievements uh, uh, over over the, say, uh, since 2007. Um, 
The first, uh, and this is extremely important and often missed, is that the, the council's agenda is now much broader and much more inclusive uh, than it has ever been. Um, 20, 30 years ago, some of the things you see on the screen uh, would not have formed uh, the part of the council's agenda, would not even be considered human rights issues by many. Uh, for example, things like the third so-called third generation rights, the right to development, permanent sovereignty over natural resources, the right to peace, the right to environment. Uh, uh, some people who are familiar with, with this, these topics will realize that these are all African uh, uh, initiatives and ideas um, uh, underlying the extent to which the agenda, at least of the council, not necessarily consensus, but the agenda of the council has come to reflect a lot of ideas that uh, are African, or at least have been embraced uh, 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 by uh, 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 Africans, uh, Latin Americans, many Europeans, Asians as well. And these are not traditional human rights ideas. Um, uh, the right uh, to be free from the adverse impacts of the dumping of toxic waste, again, another African idea. Uh, the right of peasants, a Latin American idea. Uh, the right to uh, be free from the adverse impacts of unilateral coercive measures, which is UN speak for sanctions, unilateral sanctions, um, the rights of peoples and individuals to solidarity, uh, um, the right to be free from the negative impacts of foreign debt, uh, and the necessity for an equitable and just international order. Um, these have been embraced in the agenda of the Council uh, to different degrees, of course, uh, but still integral to that agenda and day-to-day, -day, quotidian. Um, the, the, and, and in essence, my point here is that it's not just that these particular ideas are reflected, that what you have begun to see is actually much deeper. It's, it's, it's a, an expansion of epistemology. The, idea, the ways in which, the very ways in which human rights are conceived or imagined is changing. And this is something uh, that is underappreciated in my view. And for me, is a great achievement in the council, given how controversial some of these things uh, were, at least originally. Uh, uh, some of them are no longer um, all that controversial. For example, in 1982, when there was a legally binding right to the environment introduced in the African Charter, it didn't exist anywhere, right? But now uh, everybody um, understands that uh, a right to the environment is a human rights issue, right? So uh, I think that's a great attainment. Um, universal periodic review for me is also extremely important achievement. Uh, in the era of the Commission on Human Rights, uh, there was no universal review. So the review of the records of states at the level of the commission, which replaced, sorry, which the council replaced, uh, was basically uh, deeply selective in a sense, uh, 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 in the sense that um, all, most states, you know, uh, could spend decades and, and not necessarily uh, uh, be reviewed in any rigorous way or even at all. Uh, but what UPR has, uh, has achieved is that every single state in the world is reviewed, no matter how good their record is supposedly, no matter how bad their record is allegedly. Every single state is reviewed. Uh, uh, if you uh, uh, were of the debates uh, that led to the replacement of the commission, the issue of selectivity was uh, very high uh, on the agenda. Uh, it was accused of being excessively selective and so on. Uh, UPR is one way in which uh, that sort of excessive selectivity has been, in my view, greatly reduced, given that every country in the world gets reviewed periodically. Um, uh, of course, notice the stress on excessive. Uh, I use, I stress excessive because a measure 
of selectivity is uh, uh, always present. It's impossible to uh, review every single country uh, with the same degree of attention. It does not even make sense because the violation of particular rights is not evenly spread at any point in time across the world, right? So, uh, so some measure of selection uh, has to uh, happen, uh, has to be there, but the issue is the excess of it, right? So, and that's one of the things that UPR has attended to. Um, another achievement is the reform of the system of appointing the special procedures mandate holders. These are uh, your special rapporteurs, both the thematic ones, the ones that study particular themes, housing rights, uh, violence against women, and so on, uh, or international solidarity in my case, uh, and the country focused ones that are appointed to study the human rights situation in specific countries, uh, Iran, the Sudan, and so on. And uh, also independent experts, right? So some are called special rapporteurs, uh, some are called independent experts. Don't ask me why, <laughs> I don't know. Um, just depends on the language of the resolution that establishes the mechanism. And then there are the so-called uh, working groups made up of five um, experts, uh, one each from the UN's five geopolitical uh, regions. So Africa, Eastern Europe, Western Europe and others, uh, uh, Latin America and Caribbean, the Gulag, and of course, Asia Pacific. Um, excuse me. Um, now, why is this, what, what, what was this reform uh, that makes it what's celebrating as an achievement? Uh, the, the, the achievement here for me is that the process of appointment is now much more uh, merit driven one and also much more transparent than it was under the then Commission on Human Rights. So under the then Commission on Human Rights, the president of the commission, uh, the chair of the commission, simply uh, consulted and selected uh, someone. That was it. Um, now there is an entire application process. There are forms you have to fill that that uh, attend to the question of your merit uh, for that particular position. There is an attempt at adjudication uh, uh, of that marriage. There's a long list, there's an interview, uh, there's a short list, and then there's up to three names are then recommended to the president uh, with reasons, detailed rationale. You can find that all on the internet, which is, speaks to the transparency. Uh, and the president then selects again, given detailed rationale. Now, that's not to say that uh, because it is merit driven and transparent that uh, uh, politics is uh, completely out of the question. Uh, both at the level of the consultative group that does the initial selection and recommendation to the president of the Human Rights Council and the president herself or himself, they're all ambassadors, meaning they are all representatives of states. So politics clearly cannot uh, be uh, has not been eliminated it's just much more merit driven much more transparent it also pays much more explicit attention to gender inclusiveness and also to geopolitical balance uh, uh, it used to be that north america and europe by far dominated in terms of the the identity of the uh, special rapporteurs and independent experts and so on they were appointed it used to be that you know 90 percent 95 percent even were men it's no longer the case it's almost 50 50 now in terms of gender and uh, more can be done but there's a lot of improvement uh, has happened uh, as as uh, us africans uh, sometimes say in swahili it's not yet to guru but a lot of um uh, improvement uh, has occurred in terms of the, the appointing process. Um, uh, the, the next uh, achievement that I want to highlight is the sharp increase in the number of so-called standing invitations that UN member states have um, offered uh, to the 
so-called uh, special rapporteurs and independent special procedure uh, mandate holders, as we call them, uh, to visit the states at any time. That number has increased significantly. And now these visits are not just you know, to have tea, uh, these visits are uh, to assess the, their compliance uh, with international human rights standards relevant to that particular uh, mandate holder. Um, and, and so the fact that uh, um, so many states, 127 to date, uh, have offered standing invitations is very significant. Uh, of course, uh, this is not total success. Every member state uh, should have uh, issued this standing invitation to the special procedures. Uh, but, uh, but the fact that it has risen from only 89 states in 2011 uh, to 127 uh, is significant uh, success. Now, there are problems. Uh, with this that I'll get to in the next uh, segment. Um, uh, the next uh, uh, sort of achievement that I, I want to talk about is um, the fact that we now have a very functional uh, trust fund that has been established uh, uh, at the Human Rights Council to enable the participation in the work of the Council by SIDS, small island developing states, and LDCs, least developed countries, uh, in the work of the council. Many of these states, very small island states, uh, least developed countries, can not even afford to uh, um, have missions in Geneva. Many of them only have had, uh, had missions in New York, and therefore could not participate in the day-to-day -day work of the council at all. Um, uh, and some of them had missions, but maybe with one uh, uh, staff there. Uh, if anyone who has had, any, had anything to deal, do with the council knows that just the amount of paperwork that you have to review day to day alone uh, is just mind boggling. And there's no way one staff in Geneva, uh, who by the way would not handle only the, the human rights matters, you know, handle all the WHO, WIPO, and all that, uh, just doesn't cut it, right? So this fund has been extremely important uh, to the ability, uh, capacity of these states uh, to uh, participate uh, actively and participate uh, meaningfully in the work of, um, of the council is, is, is being led by a really dynamic, uh, uh, UN bureaucrat who has again increased uh, the donations, uh, worked to increase the donations uh, that have been made to this fund. And so for the first time, for instance, you now have uh, a small island developing state that has been elected, I think at the last election, uh, to sit on the council, which is a significant uh, development. All right, so I just want to highlight a few of those attainments to just show that um, the council has not been a total failure. You get that impression sometimes from uh, reading the newspapers. Um, but the council does have problems and challenges, as everyone, uh, I think, knows. And um, I'm going to talk about very quickly about some of them, and then we'll talk about how uh, we might ameliorate uh, uh, many of those problems. The first one, I think this one has really attracted a lot of attention, is the serious resource uh, deficit, budget crisis, uh, liquidity, severe liquidity crisis, as the UN itself put it, uh, the worst cash crisis in a decade um, that the UN has faced. I have to flag that that is not the first time, okay, lest we, we forget, even as far back as 1986, uh, the UN did have a a severe liquidity crisis. Uh, usually, it's uh, not usually, always it's about the failure of states to pay up or to pay uh, in a timely way. Sort of their tardiness in paying their assessed contributions to the regular budget of the UN. Uh, of course, whatever affects the UN as a whole, budget-wise, 
affects the human rights pillar, uh, that is the Human Rights Council and so on, and the Office of the High Commissioner uh, uh, for Human Rights that provides assistance and resources to the Council. Now, uh, it's important to note that uh, uh, on a good day, the uh, amount of funding from the UN's regular budget that goes to human rights is only 3.7%, just 3%, 3 to 4%, right? It's a tiny amount to begin with, a fraction of it, but then even that has been cut steeply, right? So you can imagine the the scale of the budgetary crisis that faces uh, the council and its subsidiary bodies, special procedures and so on. Uh, uh, staff reduction in staff strength, staff will retire or leave and not replaced uh, and so on and so forth. You can uh, go to more than two um, uh, fact finding uh, miss missions a year, even sometimes it's reduced to one. And when you go, you, you can't spend that much time, which affects the rigor uh, of, the, of the work that you do and so on. So the UN really does face a, a, a serious resource uh, budgetary and therefore resource uh, crisis, it affects everything. <clears throat> um, the, the second is that, uh, and this again is has been sort of uh, widely uh, performed in, in in the in the media is the uh, uh, criticism criticisms about the allegedly poor human rights records of some or many uh, member states of the Human Rights Council. Uh, for example, the elections and, and re-elections uh, to the Council uh, of certain states, Libya, 2010. Saudi Arabia three times, 2013, 2016, 2019, um, uh, attracted a lot of media attention. And there was an understandable criticism and argument that where states that have demonstrably poor, uh, excuse me, human rights records are elected, the council undermines their body's authority and credibility, legitimacy, especially in the public eye. The universal rights group uh, made this uh, uh, criticism. Many others have made that uh, criticism. And it's a, fair, it's a fair argument. However, I have to point out that there has been much less heat when other countries, certain other countries that do not also have good or great human rights records have been elected to the council. Um, and uh, I'm going to return to this when we, um, when we discuss uh, uh, how to ameliorate uh, the issue. Okay, um, excuse me. The third problem that I want to highlight is that um, concerns have been expressed regarding the alleged selectivity within the Council regarding the frequency with which uh, the human rights records of certain states are scrutinized. For example, the US withdrew from the Council in June 2018. Uh, I would like to say shockingly, but uh, it wasn't that shocking to many. Um, and so it withdrew from membership in the council. But in withdrawing, it condemned the council as biased, quote unquote, and also, quote unquote, having a disproportionate focus on Israel, right? Um, the irony is that the US and other great powers like it tend to escape scrutiny themselves, which is also if there's a bias, a form of bias. But of course, the US did not highlight uh, that fact. Um, now, uh, one, of, one of the grounds on which, to be fair, one of the grounds on which uh, the US uh, uh, alleged bias is that um, there is a permanent agenda item on Israel, right, in the council's agenda. In, but in fact, there is no permanent agenda item on Israel. There's only one on the occupied Palestinian territories. That there is a difference, right? Um, it's one thing to have an agenda item on Israel for Israel, in terms of what Israel does in its territory, but there's one on a territory that it occupies. That is a completely different thing. That is an issue-based agenda, right? In any case, there's another permanent agenda item on racism, for instance, which implicates many states, as we know, 
Uh, so it's not true uh, that there's only one permanent agenda item on one particular country, right? But again, uh, it is a thing, and there's a lot of heat uh, uh, that has been generated uh, by this argument, especially when an argument is made by, uh, you know, the most powerful country uh, in the world. Uh, so the, my, my, my sense is that the argument of the U.S. is, strictly speaking, actually, if you rigorously examine it, it's difficult to sustain, but it still generates a lot of heat regardless and has helped to undermine the council's legitimacy, in my view, in fact, as a practical matter. Whether or not that argument is rigorous enough uh, to be sustained. And so we have to do something about it, but I'll get to, I'll get to that later on. Um, the other problem, uh, and this is less highlighted, is that UN human rights fact-finding missions are not usually long enough. And because they are not long enough, they're therefore not deep or rigorous enough. And this is not a very popular position, but from my own experience, personal experience, and, he, and my own thinking, I've actually authored an entire chapter in a book by Philip Alston on human rights fact-finding, where I develop uh, this argument. Um, uh, the fact is that the budgetary constraints reduce the uh, money available uh, to undertake these fact-finding missions, meaning less time is spent, less frequency of the fact-finding. Uh, only so much can be accomplished in the one or two weeks that, uh, uh, for example, special procedure mandate holders like special rapporteurs, independent experts are allowed to spend in the field, right? Studying the human rights situation in an entire country. For a country like Nigeria, where I'm, I'm from, um, uh, 200 million people, vast country, very complicated country, even for someone like me that has studied it, you know, for 25, 30 years, uh, extremely complex uh, place. How do you, in one week or two weeks, sort out and understand, uh, especially when you, you, you know, you, you can be from Nigeria if you are, uh, a special rapporteur uh, going there to do fact finding is just one of the UN uh, rules. Uh, so you are uh, going to be a foreigner. How do you fully understand it in that short amount of time? More time allows more depth and more rigor, uh, but yet the UN does not have enough money, not their fault, to ensure this, right? Um, fact finders, including myself, we do our best, uh, but it's still a problematic uh, situation. Uh, the fact that we are assisted on these trips by staff of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, does not detract uh, at all from the argument. Um, another problem uh, that the Council faces is that there have been efforts by some states, and I must say it's a minority of states that do so in a blatant way, but still there are some states that make effort to undermine uh, our independence, the independence of uh, uh, special rapporteurs, independent experts, and so on, uh, de facto, when in fact, the in independence of the special rapporteurs and so on is paramount to their, to their work, to the legitimacy of their work, right? Um, uh, special procedure mandate holders are required by the code of conduct to be free of any kind of extraneous pressure, influence, or threat. Uh, but these threats are made, sometimes openly in council or at the General Assembly. Um, uh, at the, it's always been the case. It's not all the time, but it happens uh, uh, fairly uh, routinely. Verbal attacks and so on, uh, and attempts to prevent them from gaining access to to locations where they need to get to to do their work, right? So this is this is a serious problem that needs to be addressed. Um, a less obvious problem is what I call the yes minister problem, right? Uh, um, for those of you who know the British TV uh, series Yes Minister, it's a it's a a series on how the bureaucracy has develops its own agenda and finds ways of kind of imposing it 
on the on the political head of the ministry, right? This problem is also present uh, in terms of the relationship of special procedure mandate holders and the UN human rights bureaucracy. The bureaucracy has its own agenda, or at least parts of the bureaucracy have their own agenda. They tend to. Um, it's less obvious uh, uh, and, and difficult to apprehend, except you actually uh, engage with it, right? Um, they have what I call small p bureaucratic politics. They have what they want to do. And these are not necessarily evil things, right? But it may not be what the special rapporteur or independent expert wants to do, right? But they have their ways and means. I can't say too much about the detail here, but they have their ways and means of uh, uh, also, uh, in my view, exercising a higher degree of influence than they should over the work of uh, special procedure mandate holders. I, I think this is also a de facto independence problem. I think that special procedure mandate holders should be as free as possible, entirely free, not just of states, but also uh, be independent of the of the UN human rights uh, bureaucracy. I think that this this um, uh, uh, particular type of independence problem is produced by the fact that special procedure mandate holders do not hire or manage their own uh, uh, human rights staff in Geneva, right? And and so the incentive structure is for that staff to pay more attention to what their bosses in the bureaucracy want, uh, uh, at least, and all this is very politely, I must add, there's no conflict or anything, uh, but then actually uh, pay more attention to that than, than what the special procedure minded holder who's appointed to be independent wants to, wants to do. Um, and then uh, also another problem is that uh, I spoke about standing invitations earlier, the fact that we have so many of them now as a good thing, as an achievement of the council. However, uh, uh, there's still a problem that even uh, with the, the, the fairly high number of states that have now issued uh, these standing invitations, um, uh, too many special procedure mandate holders still experience difficulty in gaining access uh, to, to many states, even states that have issued standing invitations, which basically is an open invitation to visit. But when special uh, rapporteurs try to visit, they find that too many hurdles are still put in their way, even by states that have said we are open to a visit, right? So uh, this is rather ironic uh, and makes one question how genuine many of the standing invitations really are. So that's a problem that needs to be dealt with for the smooth functioning of the system. Um, now, the advisory committee, which I, I served on for six years, uh, lacks the power to initiate any of the studies that it conducts. It has to wait for a mandate from the council. This was not the case under the uh, regime of the UN uh, uh, Commission on Human Rights, where the equivalent body then called the Subcommission on Human uh, Protection, Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, had the power to initiate studies. In other words, had the power to properly function as the commission's think tank. Now, the advisory committee is supposed to be the council's think tank, but does not have power to think. I've actually made this argument when I was chair of the advisory committee uh, to the council itself, to the diplomats, right? Uh, how can you charge a body to think, but it cannot think freely, except you permit it to think? Uh, I think that's one problem uh, that you have. In fact, one of my former colleagues uh, on the advisory committee used to be uh, ambassador of his country uh, in Geneva. And after uh, he retired, he became a member of the advisory committee, and then he realized uh, the problem that he helped ca cause when they drafted um, uh, the mandate of this advisory committee, right? So it is a problem that, that needs to be fixed. The advisory committee should be free to think, to think on the cutting edge, to advise the council on whatever human rights uh, topic that 
uh, it, 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 it sees fit. Um, <clears throat> now, there's also a problem now, uh, it's an imagined problem um, that I want to highlight that uh, the advisory committee, unlike in the beginning, uh, is becoming composed of too few scholars. Uh, the advisory committee is a think tank, it it's basically conducts research and studies, right? So this is something that is mostly suited to trained researchers, right? And it used to be that uh, it was composed mostly of researchers, never entirely of researchers. It, it's not actually good to have only researchers on it, but mostly of researchers. Now, this is becoming less and less the case. And I think that's a problem uh, that too many retired diplomats on, on, on the committee, um, uh, in my view. Um, and my complaint here is not that you have retired diplomats on, on the advisory committee. My complaint is that you have too many. That's, that's a distinction, right? You need retired diplomats because they do have the experience about how uh, the diplomatic environment within which the advisory committee functions actually works. And they often give sage advice. I myself learned a lot from uh, about two or three of them that I worked with over the, the years about how the UN system works diplomatically, about how to actually get things done. Uh, so you do need some of them there, but when you have too many of them and too few scholars who actually do the studies, uh, then you begin to have a capacity uh, problem. Um, the, the other uh, issue um, or problem is that uh, as everyone knows, the, the rise or, or, if you like, consolidation or re-rise of right-wing populism, I offer a definition there, I will not repeat it. Uh, uh, populism or the right-wing type uh, has tended to attack and attempt to delegitimize the UN, especially uh, the UN human rights system, and attempt to defund it. This is a problem that the council uh, is confronted, uh, confronting. Uh, the council itself may not necessarily be in a position to do all that much about it, but it's still a problem uh, that faces the council uh, that, that is serious and needs to be highlighted because it leads to funding challenges, non-cooperation by the states. For example, the U.S. has now decided that it will not cooperate with any special rapporteur or independent expert and so on. Um, and also legitimacy challenges among a section of the population that then think that the Human Rights Council is a problematic institution. Um, all right, so I, I, this is just to actually set the stage, if you like, for uh, the proposals that I, I wanna make about the future of the council, about making the council fitter for the future, fitter for purpose, right? So I, I think when the proposals are modest, I hope people think they're modest, um, but, uh, uh, we'll see. Um, now, in terms of the council's funding crisis, which is really one of its major um, uh, challenges, um, I think that uh, council uh, and the office of the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights needs to seek, uh, uh, not that it doesn't already seek, but uh, intensify uh, uh, seeking alternative uh, sources of funding uh, outside the regular budget. It already does that. It has a, a sort of what is called a voluntary budget, uh, which is made up of donations from states, uh, the EU, uh, UNDP even, and so on. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, there, there needs to be an urgent effort to intensify this. Um, uh, one thing that can be done is that uh, all, there are uh, many high-income countries that don't give all that much money uh, to the uh, council through the Office of the High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that more efforts should be made to persuade them to increase uh, their contributions. Now, just to uh, give you, illustrate what I mean, in 2018, less than 8% uh, of these voluntary budgets of the for human rights came from outside the EU, Japan, 
US and Russia, which are the traditional donors that donate about 90 to 95 percent of the voluntary budget for human rights, right? So 90 to 95 percent comes from EU, Japan, the US, and Russia. Makes sense, wealthy countries, powerful countries, but this 8 percent can easily be increased, in my view, to maybe 20 percent, right? Of course, there's always the risk of tainted money, even from uh, uh, current donors. So that's an ever-present issue and should not um, hinder efforts to uh, raise uh, more funds from more countries. Now, of course, uh, other countries already give. It's just that they give only 8% of that uh, voluntary budget. And I think this needs to be expanded. Um, and uh, the problem, one problem though, is that much of this money is earmarked, meaning uh, a country would give X amount of dollars and say, you can only use it for the special rapporteur on housing rights, or you can only use it for the special rapporteur on uh, the right to development, depending on <laughs> what is that country's sort of priority or interest. Now, from the perspective of the uh, perceived national interest of that country, this may make sense, but does not make sense from the perspective of the overall human rights system. It creates have and have not special rapporteurs. Some are never, don't have enough money, while some have more, way more money uh, than they need to do their work. I think that if you have non earmarked uh, donations to a pool of funds, that can then be distributed uh, on a fair basis to special procedure mandate holders. That would be a better uh, way of doing things. Um, I also recommend that the um, uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which basically manages the budget for the council, should adopt what I call a UNICEF uh, style on the ground fundraising approach, right? And what, what is this essentially? This is uh, UNICEF has national committees that raise money everywhere, but mostly in rich countries, right? So you would have a, a, a UNICEF national committee in Canada, in, in Britain, you know, in Germany and all that, and they have membership and they raise money routinely, small amounts, right? And I think that this could help bolster the voluntary budget uh, of the, for human rights uh, at the UN. Um, my preference would be that, of course, that the regular budget be increased, but post-COVID-19, the prospects of this are even dimmer. Um, a second proposal is with regard to how to get a squeaky clean membership profile, as I call it. Whether this is possible or not, uh, uh, we'll see, but at least let's see if we can get one that does not attract as much heated uh, condemnation. Um, now, while understandable, the problem with seeking a squeaky clean membership profile lies, uh, uh, there are two problems with it. The first is the conceptual coherence of the idea itself. And then the second is the extent to which it is practicable, right? And these are related. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Now, um, uh, let me pause to say that I agree with it at the level of general ethical principle, meaning do uh, we want a squeaky clean membership of the Human Rights Council? Of course, everyone would want that. But the issue is, first of all, what do we mean when we think of a squeaky clean membership of the council, right? We say we don't want a human right, a country that violates human rights. But what does it actually mean when you actually rigorously examine it? Do we mean a country that violates civil and political rights? Do we mean a country that violates economic and social rights? Do we mean a country that violates the two kinds of rights? Do we mean a country that violates migrants' rights, indigenous people's rights? What do we mean? Um, you begin to see that in practice, in practice, when people close their eyes and they imagine a human rights violator, they're actually imagining a country that violates civil and political rights. Rarely have I seen an argument that a country where the right to food is not guaranteed should not sit on the Human Rights Council, 
right? Rarely have I heard an argument that a country where the right of housing is violated should not sit on the Human Rights Council. It's often freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and so on. So what you find is there is a problematic conceptual incoherence problem here. Economic and social rights are human rights too. So it's a limited conception of what human rights are that dri often drives the argument that human rights violators sit on the, on the council. If we were to expand that conception, uh, there'll be almost uh, very few countries, maybe the Scandinavians, would qualify to sit on the Human Rights Council. Um, uh, and secondly, there's a practicability problem, right? A problem of practicability. As Philip Austin has shown, even a so-called simple division of the world into, on the one hand, democratic, and on the other hand, non-democratic states, and then an attempt to implement it, it will be very difficult as a membership criteria. In fact, I think it was Human Rights Watch uh, that tried to propose this when the Human Rights Council was being formed and quickly dropped the idea because it is not an on and off switch. How democratic or non-democratic a country is, it's often a continuum, right? So where do you draw the precise line and say, you can't sit on the council as a member? Not that one should laud you as democratic, but that you can't sit if you, you know, if you pass this line. It's difficult. Of course, it's easy at the extremes, right? If a country is extremely democratic, that's one thing. If another one is extremely non-democratic, that's one thing. But in between, right, there's a lot of countries, most countries are sort of fall in between that, and it will be very difficult to then say, find membership uh, for the council. Um, also, we must remember that it's not the human, when we accuse the council of having these members, we should realize that it's not the council that elects its own members. It's actually the General Assembly. So, so uh, oftentimes, again, there's a confusion about the council's responsibility for its own uh, membership. Now, much better to me from a practical perspective is to specify in much greater detail the criteria for membership in the council. And to do so in a way that screens out as broad, in this, as broad a way as we can, uh, many of the states that have grossly violated all kinds of human rights, right? Um, so for uh, example, the operative paragraph eight uh, of uh, General Assembly Resolution 6251, the setup uh, that's the constitutive instrument for the Human Rights Council, uh, can be amended to include new language. Uh, this is my suggestion that would require any state uh, that within the last six years, this is just a suggestion, uh, preceding the election uh, to membership in the council um, uh, meets any one of the following criteria that any such state will be automatically ineligible to stand. So my proposal here is that there should be an eligibility criteria that is much more detailed and is geared to spe very specific forms of human rights violation. So for example, any state that has been found by the council to have failed to cooperate with the council or any of its subsidiary bodies should not be elected to the council. In fact, should not be eligible to stand, right? Um, and then uh, I'm also suggesting that uh, any state that has refused or delayed for a period of more than three years, a fact-finding visit to any of its territories uh, by any special procedure mandate holder, that treaty body or commission of inquiry should not be elected, uh, be eligible to stand for election for membership in the council. Um, uh, any state that the council has found to have attacked or attempted to intimidate or obstruct the work of a special procedure mandate holder or treaty body or commission of inquiry should not again be eligible. And then any state that has been found uh, uh, by any special procedure mandate holder or treaty body or commission of inquiry to have committed gross violations of any human right, whether that right is categorized as civil or political, 
uh, economic or social or indigenous rights or migrant rights, for instance, should not sit, uh, you know, uh, on the Human Rights Council when you massively imprison migrant children and mistreat them and they suffer untold abuses. You do not have the moral authority, in my view, to sit on the Human Rights Council. What more? Uh, trying to decide who sits on the Human Rights Council. Um, um, <clears throat> Now, the six-year baseline for measuring, quote and unquote, the state's uh, human rights record that I'm proposing is not cast in stone. It's just some suggestion. Uh, I thought six years is long enough because that's two terms of the length of the council, uh, of uh, the tenure of a state on the council. Um, now, it should also be kept in mind that the six-year baseline is a rolling baseline, right? Dating from... Uh, whenever an act was committed, so six years uh, from that, we can explain more if there's a question on that. Uh, um, again, on the whole, of course, uh, I am not naive about, about international politics. I recognize that even if you apply all these criteria faithfully, they would not screen out all gross human rights violators from eligibility for membership, but they'll be better than what we have now. Uh, alternatively, uh, the General Assembly can simply adopt these criteria as indicators and then establish a 5% credentials for screening committee made up of human rights experts to apply them to candidate states. Um, now, in terms of the problem of accu the accusations of excessive selectivity, how, do you, how does uh, the Council react or the UN system? react to this. Now, while the U.S.'s accusation of bias and selectivity against the Council is to me not all that convincing, it is still capable of doing some damage to the Council, not the least because of the U.S.'s massive aviational uh, ideas, political and economic power. So to be pragmatic, uh, something needs to be done, right, to take away this excuse. Uh, from those who would not cooperate with the council on that basis. Um, uh, one thing that could be done is to include other situations in which there are egregious human rights violations uh, on the council's permanent agenda, and, and this should not be difficult, unfortunately, to find those situations. Um, or, as suggested by a former uh, Deputy High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Bertrand Ramcharan, uh, the council's agenda could also be restructured away from having the same uh, agenda items for all council sessions. And I can talk more in detail about, about that proposal if there's a question on it. Um, uh, this would then allow council to focus on, on whatever it wanted to focus on, right? And, and just not making it a permanent agenda item does not mean it cannot be an agenda item. That's my, that's my point. Uh, now, improving the council's fact-finding system uh, made the point earlier that the length of these missions affected their depth and rigor. Um, uh, I suggest a modest uh, period of four weeks minimum for special procedures, independent experts, working groups uh, to conduct in-country fact-finding missions. We call them country visits. Now, um, excuse me. Now the funds will of course be an issue uh, in an era of declining resource capacity, uh, even more so post the economic downturn that will surely follow uh, uh, this uh, pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> so why would I be asking the UN to spend more money? Because if you increase the visit from one or two weeks to four weeks minimum, that requires you spending more money. Well, by my calculation, it will require uh, an estimated additional six million US dollars per annum to be able to do this, what I propose. Nine countries and the UDP and the EU, each of them gave six million or more in 2018. So it's not totally impossible to find a country annually that can give you six million US dollars. That's, that's my point, especially if you expand the if you work hard to expand uh, the uh, cohort 
of donors uh, uh, to the voluntary fund. Uh, now, of course, uh, this voluntary fundraising should be an interim measure until the UN regular budget is restored, uh, hopefully, uh, eventually. Um, okay, um, the other proposal is on enhancing the independence of the Council's uh, special procedure uh, mandate holders from states, de facto. Um, I think that the, the UN ought to do more to hold states that behave in the, in, in the ways that they have behaved to threaten uh, the, uh, the independence of special procedure mandate holders. They should do more to hold them accountable. Mayor rebukes verbal condemnations are not adequate given the gravity of the offense, given how much independence is important to the faithful discharge of the responsibility of special procedure mandate holders. One, one proposal uh, is that any, uh, I've, I've already made this proposal, is that any state that attacks or intimidates, obstructs the work of special procedure or treaty body or commission of inquiry uh, within the last six years preceding any election should be ineligible uh, to contest. This will not totally end that behavior, but at least it will uh, be a robust response to it. Um, now, enhancing the independence of the Council's special procedure mechanisms from the uh, human rights bureaucracy, I think this uh, is important in the light of what I call the yes minister uh, problem. Um, uh, the special procedure mandate holders uh, should be empowered to interview, select, excuse me, and appoint their own uh, human rights officers, their own uh, assistants, uh, albeit from a pool of existing uh, uh, staff of the Office of the High Commissioner. Uh, in other words, uh, staff of that office who already appointed that office working there uh, should be allowed to apply for any vacancy and the special uh, rapporteur or independent expert should be able to interview a short list and interview those there they think are qualified and hire them i think this will alter the incentive structure uh, uh, away from the current structure which dictates that staff of these special procedure mandate holders uh, pay significantly more attention to their bureaucratic bosses, their bureaucratic policies, their bureaucratic procedures than what the supposedly independent special procedure mandate holder wants to achieve. Um, I think that standing ovations need to be made more meaningful um, um, and uh, I think that the rule I've proposed uh, early on in this talk, uh, that if you delay a country visit for more than three years, you should be barred from uh, eligibility uh, to stand as a, uh, for election as a member of the council will help. It will not totally solve it. It's a modest proposal to help uh, along the way. Um, I think the advisory committee should simply be allowed to initiate its own uh, formal uh, studies and reports and advice to the Human Rights Council. I've already explained why this is important. Um, I also think that I've, I've explained why as well, that uh, the um, advisory committee should be composed of a minimum uh, of 14 researchers relatively senior researchers, preferably academics, but not necessarily academics. Not every researcher is an academic, but at least they have, should have uh, evidence that they have uh, uh, a significant experience uh, at the senior level as human rights researchers. Um, the current language in the relevant texts is too loose and general. Um, this may be a hard sell in terms of 
the council amending the language because of course the council is run by diplomats and the rationale is that there are too many retired diplomats. Um, this may be a hard sell uh, at the council, but uh, hope springs eternal as they say. Um, oh, Right-wing populism uh, has had a negative impact on the on the council's work and needs to be um, attended to. Now, uh, right-wing populism is not going to be ameliorated uh, primarily because of whatever the council does. It's going to have to happen country by country. It's a, it, these are political questions uh, that countries have to deal with. However, um, the, there are things the council can do to help a lot. It can conduct more studies on the question that illuminate the damage that it does to human rights and the work of the council. It can hold panel, more panel discussions on it. It can pass uh, more condemnatory resolutions and respond uh, as robustly as it possibly can to communications and complaints about, about uh, uh, the impact of, or negative impact of such uh, populism. Um, Lumi, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, yeah, yeah, I see you coming to yeah. your conclusion. I, I know we've yeah. got a string of really interesting questions, and I'm we're going to still have time for that. So, do you want to just quickly Actually. wrap up in a minute or two, and then yes. we'll put we'll yes, give you some um, interesting um, questions? Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kate, for that reminder. Uh, professors take, uh, tend to talk for too long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, in, uh, in conclusion, I just want to say uh, that. You've seen there are attainments, there are problems, and there are, in my view, modest uh, reforms uh, that I think uh, that, that can be um, instituted uh, to ameliorate um, many of those uh, 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 problems. And uh, because uh, I want to hear and respond to as many questions as possible, I'll just uh, leave it at that and just to uh, thank everyone uh, for their attention thank you okay well thank you very much for a, a really um very insightful and thoughtful uh, overview of of the of the council and both its its um, pluses and minuses and, and some suggestions for going forward. We have um, a, a big array of questions and just to thank all of you who put in questions, we're really grateful for you for that. We're probably not gonna be able to get to all of them and we also understand that not everyone's gonna be able to stay through this process of Q&A, but um, just to those of you who are gonna have to leave, thanks very much for joining. Do keep an eye on our, on our website and register on Eventbrite for our events because we have a whole string of events coming up over the next um, month or, or so. Um, Sanya, can I turn to you? Do you want to summarize some of the questions that have come in? Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, yeah, so we've got questions that span four themes. <laughs> so I think what we'll do, Prof, is we'll start with um, it's probably the most pressing theme that's on everyone's mind, and um, which I'm sure you are expecting as well. Uh, the theme relate to reform and future directions as well as COVID and the effect that that would have. Um, so I'm just going to quickly read out, um, I've got five questions here, but I'm going to try and shorten them. So my apologies in advance to the questioners um, if I have misunderstood your question, but I'm sure that um, Professor Okafor will be able to um, get the gist of it. So the first one is regarding proposal three, selectivity. Um, the question is, would it not be better to adopt a model that would be consistent with the item on racism? Um, that is, namely to have permanent agenda items that are thematic. That's the first question. The second one is, uh, what would the approach be to proposal two, considering political and economic inequality among states? Um, further, how would this... Can you repeat that? I didn't quite get that. Um... The question is, what would be the approach on proposal two? considering the political and economic inequality among states. For example, mm. the US's attitude on withdrawing funds from the WHO comes to mind. Again, mm -hmm. what would be the reaction on the post-COVID era, considering African states' precarious situations in light of developing countries wanting to contribute to funding in any event? The third question is, um, what can the special agencies of the UN bring to a post-COVID world that will mitigate the crisis? How might it offer a way forward that would win the backing of a broad coalition of policymakers, lawyers, 
administrators and the common people. <laughs> I'm going to proceed with the last. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here slightly. <laughs> if you could just say it a little slower, please. Uh, the, the last question was what? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. The question is in a post COVID world, what can mm -hmm. the special agencies of the UN bring to mitigate the crisis? Hmm. How might it well, offer a way forward that would win the backing of a broad coalition of policymakers, lawyers? administrators, as well as the common people. Mm. Okay. And then this is quite an interesting question, which I must admit came to my mind as well. Who should be authorized to specify the criteria for election to the council? Would it be the General Assembly? And would that not take us back to square one? Mm. And finally, um, the final question related to that, it's quite a long one, but shortening it, how are we going to negotiate on the management front, knowing that at present, it requires a delicate combination of technical knowledge, legal expertise, diplomacy, which all needs to be cultivated among several different services. Otherwise, that will lead to a breakdown in economic, social and political terms. So how are we going to coordinate and manage this combination moving forward. So management of what exactly? I'm not quite getting. Yeah. So the question is set in the context of the existing assumptions and beliefs that the UN Human Rights Council will achieve um, currently through its involvement goals and development, which seems to be a little beyond the immediate technical objectives, which according to the questioner can be thwarted by the gaps in planning, design, implementation and management of interdepartmental relations. Mm. Okay. What would this, what would moving forward with this look like in a post COVID world? Okay. Those are the questions in the first theme. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right. With regard to the, the, first of all, thank you uh, to everyone who asked questions and apologies if I spoke too long for your questions uh, to, to, to get to me. Uh, um, with regard to the first question on selectivity, I believe, uh, on a model uh, where you only have themes. Um, uh, oh, uh, in terms of a permanent agenda item. Well, one, one alternative, uh, as I said, not because I believe uh, there's an, anything necessarily wrong in having a permanent agenda, is just uh, that you could get away from that entirely. So as Ram Charan said, um, or um, you could put more. I actually don't believe in putting less. <laughs> I, I think that you should put more on that agenda, right? I, I, think, I don't think that the solution is less problems on the human rights agenda when there are many, many problems in the world. I think you can add more to it. Um, uh, but in terms of a thematic model, I really think, I think that's what I, what I was getting at. I really think that essentially it is, a, it is a thematic model. For example, if you say uh, thematically that racism is on the permanent agenda, there are a lot of countries that implicate it. It implicates countries. It's not just racism in the inner world out there somewhere. It's racism in particular places, and it's more severe in uh, some places than others, right? Um, and, and it does, so in other words, there's no thematic that is without geopolitical implication or geographic implication. There is a geography of injustice, as Pedro Bakshi often said, right? So in this case, yes, the occupied territories is a name, but it is not the territories that is the issue. It is the injustice of occupation that is that issue, right? So that's what I, I was getting at. It is, in, it is both thematic and geographical, right? In both cases, it is how it is captured. Of course, you can recouch it, but that's one thing. But my, my issue is, in 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 any case, there's not much. Uh, to be lost from taking away that excuse for non-cooperation and just get you know getting rid of the permanent agenda 
and then see why there's non-cooperation, right? I, I, I assure you there will continue to be non-cooperation even if you don't have the permanent agenda item. So I don't actually think that's the main issue. It's just an excuse uh, to justify non-cooperation. Um, uh, now, in terms of the uh, proposal two, I think there was a question on that that I made as to a squeaky clean membership. I understand the, que the question is about, is, is my proposal practical uh, given the US's uh, attitude? I, I think so. I think that if you look at, for example, there's a paper in the Melbourne, I think 2008 or nine Melbourne Journal of International Law that Philip Alston uh, authored, where he goes through uh, the, analyzes the, the records of all the debates and the proposals. There's a lot of interest, including from the UN, uh, sorry, the US itself, on specifying criteria. The problem is that they, they couldn't agree on this issue. That's, that was my uh, point about practicality, uh, one of my points about practicality on uh, what constitutes a democratic country and what doesn't, or what constitutes a good human rights country and what doesn't. That's why, if you look at my criteria, these are very specific, measurable things. That, that, that's actually about the line point. Right, that are difficult for any country to oppose. Uh, it is difficult to say, oh, um, I should sit on the council when I do not cooperate with the council, right? But once you get to this issue of democratic or undemocratic, it's very difficult to get any consensus. So I think that if you use that, those approaches that still get at the good human rights behavior, it's a better kind of uh, way uh, of almost a sort of uh, proxy, right? For a better proxy for getting a good human rights behavior and if you like democracy without actually uh, being stuck uh, in some debate around what does democracy really mean or, uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, in terms of the, hmm, how can you, I think the next question is about how can we get um, I'm not sure I got this question very well. Uh, what kind of specialized agencies bring to the table? Is, was that a question around uh, in terms of uh, getting a, a broad agenda? I think that the what I might say, I would say to that is that the, um, the Office of the High Commissioner uh, already cooperates uh, with a range of specialized agencies. I think the council does uh, special uh, procedure mandate holders. I know that one of the first things I did when I was appointed uh, as independent expert was to visit uh, a, a, a number of UN uh, agencies other than the Office of the High Commissioner and see how we could work. At that time, the um, global compacts on refugees and the other on migrants was being negotiated. So I actually had a very good meeting at uh, the office of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And uh, uh, we cooperated. I also had a meeting with UNDP at the headquarters in New York and all that. Uh, so I, I think that that cooperation uh, is great. Uh, I think it can continue uh, and should continue. Uh, uh, I think that's, if I understand the question, uh, if it's about coordination, uh, that's what I, I would say. Um, who, <laughs> very interesting question, who should specify criteria for membership? Uh, uh, is it the General Assembly? And does that take us back to square one? I, I don't think we can uh, escape it being the General Assembly. That is the, uh, if you like, in these respect. Uh, the Human Rights Council reports to the General Assembly. So the Human Rights Council will, of course, initially propose the criteria. Uh, that's the Council proposed to the General Assembly, but it has to be adopted by majority vote in General Assembly. No, I don't think it would bring us to, to, to square one, because I think these criteria do not uh, uh, have the problems that earlier uh, criteria have of trying to have these woolly uh, uh, normative 
uh, what shall I say, much more normative concepts that are not easily measured, right? Um, I think that when you say non-cooperation, it is objective. It's either you've cooperated or you haven't cooperated, right? Um, uh, with, with, um, with the council, uh, have you been found by a special rapporteur to have grossly violated migrant rights, for example, or indigenous people's rights? Again, you can simply do a search of the special rapporteur's reports. It's much like universal periodic review right now, right? As we speak, that's what uh, happened. The Office of the High Commissioner, one of the documents that uh, is used for universal periodic review is simply an, uh, based on an ob a compilation of objective facts, right? In the work of special rapporteurs, independent experts, working groups, treaty bodies, commissions of inquiry. And these are objective things, right? So it's, these, these reduce the scope uh, for debate. That's all we can do, right? Um, uh, in terms of them being much more specifiable, much more measurable indicators. Um, I must confess I didn't quite get the last question, but in terms of COVID, I know that there was something about COVID-19 uh, and the effect it will have. I think that COVID-19, there will be a downturn. Now, I'm, not, I'm not an economist, so I don't know if it will be a recession or a depression, but there will be serious downturn post-pandemic, right? It, there are already indicators, uh, growth, growth forecasts, uh, not that growth is everything, but growth forecasts are already being scaled down. So I read about Ghana's uh, yesterday, it was projected to grow at 6.8% this year, it's been cut down to 1% already, uh, without the pandemic being over. Um, so there will be a downturn, and therefore, uh, to the extent that many of these reforms require uh, expansion of the resources available to the UN, uh, this may be difficult, but the, the, hopefully the downturn will not last forever, right? So um, uh, post-COVID, uh, those that are not uh, practical or practicable because of the paucity of resources can be, um, uh, you can put a pause on them, uh, and they can always get back to them uh, post-COVID. Um, um, that, that's what I would, I would say in terms of the effect that COVID-19 will have on some of these reforms. I also want to actually say, not because I'm the uh, independent expert on human rights and international solidarity, is that um, uh, gratify, shall I say, by the extent to which the COVID pandemic has focused the mind of a lot of us, of the international community, on the um, necessity for international solidarity and the depth, the sheer depth of its connection to the realization of human rights. The fact that this pandemic will not end for anyone whatsoever or until it ends for everyone has underlined, underlined for me and for a lot of people in a very stark way, really, unfortunately, but it has done so, uh, the extreme importance of solidarity, right? How we cannot realize human rights fully without international solidarity. So I think that that's one lesson that could be taken, hopefully, uh, like to be hopeful in the end, uh, from, from this pandemic. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. If I didn't do justice to your question, I apologize. Um, thank you very much indeed. That was, uh, you know, uh, really very interesting. Uh, we, I know that we have a few more questions, but I must say your remarks on COVID-19 seem to me to be particularly pertinent, that in a sense, um, this is a moment to realise how globally bound together we all are and what that should mean for the human rights movement, for the movement for international cooperation, international organisations going forward even if it isn't the lesson that some people are going to take from it, the underlying reality, as you say, until, until we are all safe from COVID-19, none of us are fully safe from COVID-19. And that really, I think the other thing that's coming out of COVID-19 is a real 
illustration of the problems of inequality, not only between um, between states, but within states. Again and again, one is seeing that the message of COVID-19 is that inequality is um, uh, deepens the the, the, the the people who have less are much more likely to suffer more from COVID-19. And one would hope that that message too is a message that is picked up by the international community. I know that we have a lot more questions and I'm sure that we have many people who are listening who would like us to put those questions, but um, I'm also conscious that we've, um, we've taken a lot of your time, um, Professor Okafor, and on behalf of everybody here, I would like to thank you very much for your insights. Um, I, I actually find your proposal too enormously sensible and I also think arguably achievable. Um, sub four strikes me as there might be a bit of a pushback in the General Assembly, but, but it seems to be a very sensible idea and one that maybe we should be looking as a human rights community to be um, joining hands over because I think that would be would do an, an enormous amount of good. Um, finally, to all of those who have been listening, thank you very much for joining us at the Bonavera Discussion Group. Uh, just a reminder again that we have future events that you'll find out about on our website. We would also be very grateful as we are complete, well certainly me, and happy at this game and we would really welcome any feedback that you've got about what you found difficult, what you found good, who you'd like to hear from, etc. Please feel free to send us some notes. Um, we would we'd really like to be there. And finally, to say a particular warm welcome to the MSC, MST students who I know have joined us. Um, and we are delighted that we have found a way to join you into our discussions and we look forward to further discussions with you uh, in the weeks and months ahead. So to end off now, I'm just going to look at um, Christos and Sonia in case I've forgotten anything important. Um, but if, if I haven't, then we'll, we'll say goodbye for the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you okay, so much. And, uh, uh, warm Kate, thanks to uh, Professor thank you all and to our team. wonderful technical team. And goodbye thank for the moment, so everybody, and hope to see you again thank soon. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.